It is the year 2019. The world is overcrowded, decaying, mechanized. Android slaves programmed to live for only four years are technological marvels, strong, intelligent, physically indistinguishable from humans. Into this world comes a band of rebel androids, desperate to find the mastermind who built them, bent on extending their lifespan. They will use all their superhuman strength and cunning to stop anything or anyone who gets in their way. Ordinary people are no match for them. Neither are the police. This is a job for one man only. Rick Deckard, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Story adaptation by Les Martin. From the screenplay by Hampton Fancher and David Peoples. Based on the original novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? by Philip K. Dick. Directed by Ridley Scott. Produced by Michael Dealey. Narrated by Amy Mullen. Chapter 1. The huge blimp moved over the city. Below it, a million lights flickered in the misty night air while factory smokestacks belched forth flames. Dimly visible through the haze were two huge buildings, flat-topped pyramids 800 floors high. They were the headquarters of the Tyrell Corporation. Silent and awesome, Dwarfing the battered skyscrapers left over from the 20th century, they towered above the decaying slums and crowded, neon-lit streets like mammoth temples to an alien god. These great buildings were the last gasps of progress in America in the year 2019. They had been completed just before the leaders of America and the rest of the world had finally admitted that time was running out for civilization as they had made it on Earth. There was too little good air left and too few natural resources. There was just one way to head off total collapse. The blimp's super-powered loudspeakers blared its message down to the horde of humanity that packed the city. Attention! All who want a better life for yourself and your children! Attention! Everyone who can meet our simple standards of health, age, and ability! We offer you the ultimate in opportunity! Top pay! Automatic advancement! A completely controlled California-style climate. Fabulous, fun-filled recreation areas. And now, as a very special bonus, we offer you absolutely free of charge the newest and finest generation yet of our marvelous man-made labor force. Yes, you can be the proud and happy owner of your very own Tyrell Corporation Nexus replicant in the size color, and sex of your choice to serve your every want and need in our great new Dominguez and Shimata space colonies. Rick Deckard heard the blimp's message as he sat eating raw fish on rice at a crowded open-air food bar. The recorded voice cut through the din of honking horns and gunning motors from the street and the babble of Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, and occasional English around him. When Deckard heard, quote, Nexus Replicant, unquote, he stopped with his chopsticks halfway to his mouth, suddenly losing his appetite. What were they like? Deckard wondered. The newest replicants, or reps, or robots, or androids, or skin jobs, or whatever you wanted to call them as they came off the assembly lines, each new model more lifelike than the one before. How hard were they to control now? How hard were they to catch when they broke free? How hard were they to spot when they pretended to be humans? How hard were they to kill? 
Deckard tried to stop wondering. He stared at his raw fish. He didn't want to imagine what it would be like to off the latest model Nexus. The last runaway rep he had hunted down was a Nexus III. Even that early model made him sick to his stomach when it went dead. It was too close to seeing a real person die. And since then, the Tyrell Corporation had kept its top brains working overtime to keep offering the most lifelike humanoid slaves on the market, aimed at people willing to take the big leap off-world. The Tyrell Nexus line was the big reason why America stayed number one in the worldwide race to settle outer space. Deckard was glad he had quit when he did. He never wanted to pull the plug on an android again. Let the cops hire somebody else to do their dirty work, to deal with the danger they didn't want the public to know anything about. Let them pay their blood money to another Blade Runner. That was their name for him, instead of Bounty Hunter or Hitman. It sounded nicer, he supposed. Cleaner, as if they were using some kind of shiny, efficient machine. They could forget how messy blowing away a skin job could be and how it made a man feel. He couldn't. Deckard sat there, wedged between a wrinkled Oriental and a lean young Latino, feeling totally alone, a freelance detective without any work, a hard man with a dangerous soft spot. Suddenly, Deckard wasn't alone anymore. Somebody tapped him sharply on the shoulder. He wheeled around in his seat, then froze. He was looking up at two huge, black-uniformed cops, visors masking their faces. With them was a short, mustached Japanese. His pork pie hat, fancy suit, and jaunty bow tie made Deckard's own floppy brown raincoat, checked shirt, limp wool tie, and unpressed trousers look ready for the trash heap. The man even carried an elegant cane. But Cop was shining out of his eyes like a spotlight. His accent was as thick as smog. Deckard could barely make out the words he recited. You will be required to accompany me, sir, if you do not comply with this official request. I will be obliged to exert my authority. Sorry, pal, Deckard said. No comprendo. Try learning English. It's handy for dealing with the natives. Deckard turned back to his food. He say, you under arrest. You go with him, said the Chinese counterman. No trouble here. You go quick. Deckard turned back to the cops. You got the wrong guy. Go away. I'm eating. Or maybe you want to join me. I recommend the fish heads. Best in town. You know wrong guy, the Japanese said. You the one they call bogeyman. You the one they call Mr. Nighttime. You the best blade runner in business. Captain Bryant say, bring you to him. Bryant say, you be ornery. Okay, then I be not so nice. Bryant say, bring you in, even if I have to serve you like raw fish. The two uniformed cops edged closer. Bryant, huh? Deckard said. Congratulations. You just said the magic word. It works even better than please. He stood up, his bowl in one hand, chopsticks in the other. Let's not keep the captain waiting. The cops hustled Deckard into their car. It was a sleek new spinner, its metal high-polished, its glass bubble shining. The driver pressed the starter. 
Instantly, the helicopter-style propeller on the rear began to whirr. The spinner lifted high above the crazy quilt crush of cars and trucks, vans, and motorbikes. It sped on a beeline through the air toward a gleaming building on the horizon. Deckard knew the building well. Police headquarters. Ooh, that's a nice picture. Chapter 2 Bryant didn't bother to get up when the Japanese brought Deckard into his office. He didn't even bother to look pleased. He just said, Okay, Gaff, you can leave him here with me. Buzz off. The man called Gaff gave Deckard one last knife-edged look and left. Nice boy you have there, said Deckard. Gaff, said Bryant. Not too smooth, but he does his job. You wouldn't have come if I'd just mailed you an invitation. Sit down, Deckard. Take a load off your feet. Deckard remained standing. Let's not play games, Deckard, Bryant said. I don't have the energy, and you don't have the time. I've got four skin jobs walking the streets that are just your meat. They killed twenty-three people when they busted loose on Dominguez. They hijacked a space shuttle. We found the shuttle in the desert a hundred miles from here. Empty. How embarrassing, said Deckard. What will people think? I pity the jokers who dreamed up the new off-world ad campaign. A rep that can turn around and kill its master will be hard to sell as an ideal slave. It's not going to be embarrassing at all, Bryant said. Because nobody's going to find out about those skin jobs. Because you're going to find them first and air them out. Try using Holden, said Deckard. He's good. Not in your league, said Bryant. He doesn't have your kind of magic. Anyway, we did try him. He fingered one of them working right in the Tyrell laboratory. The trouble was... The skin job spotted Holden, too. Holden can still breathe, as long as the docks don't pull out the plugs. Use Gaff, then, said Deckard. He looks eager. You'll get double pay, said Bryant, and expenses. No dice, said Deckard. I'm through. I told you that after the last time. Bryant shook his head slowly as if it pained him to do even that much. Bryant was a big, balding, middle-aged man. He looked like a bull that had gone to fat. He had a bad stomach, a rotten liver, a bum heart. Extra effort made him sweat. He wasn't going to waste words arguing. You know the score, Deckard. When you're with us, you're plugged into the power. When you're not with us... Bryant made a quick, brutal yanking motion, as if he were pulling an electric plug from its socket. Nothing more had to be said. Or done. Deckard knew the score. He had just managed to forget it for a little while. Being on the outside made it easy to imagine that you had a choice, that you could say no. But when you faced Bryant, you were facing the truth. Deckard sat. Okay, he said. Fill me in on the details. One thing we're pretty sure of is that they're in the city, Bryant said. For some reason, they're trying to get into the Tyrell complex. Originally, they were five loose. One of them got fried by the electrofield protecting Tyrell. And, like I said, Holden found another who had made it into the Tyrell lab. But the skin job blasted Holden and got away. With all the places on earth to hide, said Deckard, why would they head for Tyrell? It's the last place in the world they'd be safe. Who knows why, said Bryant. Who can figure out what goes on in those heads of theirs? But if anyone can, it's you, Deckard. That's why you're getting top dollar. You know how they think. They don't think, said Deckard. They just calculate. 
Sometimes their calculations get screwed up. That's all. If you say so, said Bryant as he pressed a button. The room darkened, and a whole wall of television screens lit up. Pictures of the missing replicants appeared. First came a dark-haired, hulking, ox-like man, his eyes tiny in his big face. Meet Leon, Bryant said. A real sweetheart. He could break your arm with one hand. Next, a doll-faced brunette, six feet tall. Zora. She knocked her owner cold with just a slap. Then a woman with the body of a goddess, her perfect features framed by a mass of spiky, straw-colored hair. Pris. She mangled five men who went after her. Bryant let the screens go blank for a moment. Now here's the really bad news. Roy Batty. The screens filled with a beautifully built, pale-haired giant of a man wearing only a loincloth. He was doing one-armed push-ups, first one arm, then the other. Hundreds and hundreds, not even breathing hard. Then he was bashing down a steel post, his hands going bloody, without a hint of pain in his, in his sleet gray eyes. Roy Batty is Tyrell's top-of-the-line Nexus 6 combat model, a super soldier. He's fought in 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit on the Argentine moons and at 800 below in deep space. He's survived every space war for the past two years without a scratch. Tyrell outdid themselves with him. Thank God they at least put a special control device into the Nexus 6. So even Tyrell got nervous, said Deckard. He was still staring at Roy Batty, half hypnotized by Batty's sheer perfection. I can see why. Tyrell was worried that the Nexus 6 might be too close to human. Given time, a Nexus 6 might develop emotions. Love, hate, anger, pity, garbage like that. So Tyrell added a gimmick. A real cute gimmick. After four years, every Nexus 6 goes dead. Bryant pushed the button. The screen went dark, and the room lights came on. But they can still raise a lot of hell between now and their termination date. Get hopping, Deckard. One more question, Deckard said. Exactly how close to human are they? Will the Voigt Kampf still work on them? We're not sure, Bryant said. But it's easy to find out. I've checked with Tyrell. They've got a demo Nexus 6 in their home office. Hop a spinner and check it out. Chapter 3 A small and beautiful white owl fluttered through the office of Dr. Eldon Tyrell, founder and guiding brain of the huge Tyrell Corporation. Like our pet? asked Rachel, Dr. Tyrell's secretary. It's artificial? Deckard asked. Of course not, said Rachel. Expensive? Very, said Rachel. Less than a dozen left on earth. Rachel was like that owl, Deckard thought. Beautiful and fine-feathered, with fancy clothes and a chic hairdo. She was the kind of secretary that a big wheel like Tyrell would have, to show how big a wheel he was. Right now, Rachel was making small talk as they waited for her boss to arrive. "'What do you think about our new Nexus Sixes, Mr. Deckard? "'I hope your work doesn't prejudice you against them.' "'Deckard gave his automatic answer. "'Replicants are like any other machines. "'They can be a benefit or a hazard. "'When they're a benefit, 
they're not my business. May I ask a personal question, Mr. Deckard? Shoot. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? No, said Deckard, and stopped. He was as surprised as Rachel at how loud the word had come out. The silence that followed seemed even louder. When Dr. Tyrell entered the room, Deckard felt a wave of relief. Deckard didn't have to worry about getting personal with Dr. Tyrell. Tyrell was all business, from the tips of his gleaming black shoes to the top of his close-cropped dark hair. He had a granite-like chin, a steel trap of a mouth, and glinting eyes behind glinting glasses. Even the Nexus Threes looked more human than their creator. "'You've brought the Voigtkampf?' the doctor asked brusquely. "'Right in this case,' said Deckard. "'Where's your Nexus Six? "'The Voigtkampf?' asked Rachel. "'It's a test to measure emotional re reactions,' explained Tyrell. It used to be the one sure way to tell replicants from humans, but I must say I'm not convinced of its reliability any longer. In fact, Mr. Deckard, I'd like to see an experiment, a test of your test. I want to see the score a human makes on it before you test our newest nexus. Let Rachel try it. A waste of time, Deckard said. Let me be the judge, said Tyrell. If you don't mind, Deckard said to Rachel. Why should I mind, she said. It'll be fun. An hour later, as the test neared its end, the fun for Rachel had faded. She sat with her brows furrowed in tense concentration, waiting for the next question. Deckard's eyes moved from the Voigtkampf screen, where the picture showed the pupils of Rachel's eyes, to the needles swinging from green to red on the Voigtkampf gauges. Last question, Deckard said. You're watching an old movie. It shows people enjoying a meal of raw oysters. Ugh, said Rachel, and the needles swung violently. The next course is boiled dog stuffed with rice, said Deckard. Rachel was silent. The needles barely moved. Raw oysters are less acceptable to you than a dish of boiled dog, said Deckard, snapping off the machine. Let me explain, Rachel began. That will be all, Rachel, Dr. Tyrell said. Mr. Deckard and I have business to discuss. Highly classified business. He indicated the door with his eyes. Rachel stood up, holding herself stiffly, not looking back. She left the room. My God, said Deckard. She doesn't know. I'm afraid she's beginning to suspect, said Dr. Tyrell. A pity, really. She's a pet project of mine. It seemed our Nexus Sixes have a need for memories. There are empty places inside them that demand to be filled. In Rachel, I implanted replicas of the memory cells of my 16-year-old niece. Rachel remembers exactly what my niece remembers. You can see what a success it's been. It took the Voigtkampf at least ten times longer than normal to penetrate to her non-human core. I've never even really needed the Voigtkampf before, said Deckard, talking more to himself than to Tyrell. I've always just known, the moment I met one, until now. Deckard shook his head to clear it. He felt like somebody had smacked him hard in the face. He looked at the white owl perched on a desk. That owl was more real than Rachel. Except that Rachel was real to Deckard. 
very real. I'm sure you'll find our Nexus 6 a truly stimulating challenge, said Dr. Tyrell. I envy you. Chess is the only game that offers me a challenge, and it's so hard to find good enough opponents to make it interesting. Deckard stood beside Tyrell at his high office window. He looked down at the acres of smoking factories surrounding the Tyrell building, and beyond that, the city stretching to the horizon. Somewhere on that immense chessboard, four figures were moving. Four figures to be found and taken. Chapter 4 The big man with tiny eyes and a small mustache stood in the dark beneath a burned-out streetlight. His name was Leon, and he burned with anger as he watched two men ransacking his hotel room across the street. One of them had short hair and wore a brown raincoat. The other was a natalie dressed Japanese. Leon's rage flared even higher when he saw the man in the raincoat standing by the window, riffling through a collection of photos he had found. Batty was right, thought Leon. The police had traced the hotel address through Leon's employment files at the Tyrell lab. Leon had been dumb to risk coming back here just for a few snapshots of Jora and the others. But those pictures were all he had left of them all together, before they had split up for safety's sake. Now he didn't even have them. They had them just like they had everything else. Just like they used to have him and Jora and even Batty, though it was hard to imagine anyone owning Batty. Thinking of Batty, Leon looked at his watch and moved off, fast as a cat. Batty was waiting where he said he would be. Leon knew Batty would be there. Batty always did what he said. "'Don't waste time telling me you got there too late,' Batty said. "'We don't have time to waste.' He was already moving toward the door of a store whose sign read, "'Hannibal Chew. "'We must warn Jora to find a new safe place before the police track her down,' said Leon. "'They aren't that fast.' said Batty. If they were, we'd all be dead by now. We'll warn Jora, but first we must pay a visit to Mr. Chu. Inside the building, Mr. Chu was wearing his usual working gear, a heavy fur coat and insulated gloves. Even so, his wizened Chinese face was pinched with cold. His beard was frosty, and his breath steamed in the icy laboratory air. He froze in surprise when the door was suddenly thrust open. He was even more shocked when he saw that the men who entered didn't mind the cold, though frost coated their clothes. "'We have questions.' Roy Batty said with a smile colder than the air. Still smiling, he plunged his naked hand into a tank of ultra-freeze. He pulled out a perfect blue eye. You replicant! Chu screamed. You illegal! Batty dropped the eye and with an easy motion ripped off Chu's fur coat. At the same time, Leon's huge fist smashed in a glass aquarium brimful of thousands of floating, unblinking eyes. Eyes flooded the floor. They squished beneath Batty's feet as he selected a fur coat from a rack of spares. He dangled the coat in front of the violently shivering Chew. Okay, I give answers, said Chew. Just give me coat. What is the use life of a Nexus 6? Batty demanded. When were we made? 
How do we die? What can we... Questions flooded out of him. I do not know, shouted Chu, his teeth chattering. I do just eyes, know nothing else. I thought perhaps also feet, said Batty, or hands, muscle tissue, noses. Just eyes, said Chu. Got no more answers. Now give me coat, okay? Who does have the answers? asked Batty, still dangling the coat. Dr. Tyrell, big boss, big genius. He know everything. He design your brain. Now, please, coat! By now, Chu was shaking like a leaf in an arctic gale. Not an easy man to see, I guess, said Batty. He must have top security. Sebastian take you to big boss, said Chu. J.F. Sebastian, 2077, 897th Avenue, Sector 6, please, coat. Thank you, said Batty, and thank you for my eyes, too. They're a pleasure to use. Unblinking, Batty watched Chu stop shaking and start to stiffen. They left Chu lying like a fallen statue in a sea of eyes as hard as marbles. The next day, at dusk, J.F. Sebastian's eyes widened as he stumbled over a body half-concealed in the trash in front of his apartment. His eyes widened further when a beautiful young woman stood up to face him, her startled face framed by a mass of spiky, straw-colored hair. Sebastian was used to people being startled by his withered face. Doctors called what was wrong with him the Methuselah syndrome. It meant his glands were aging him before his time. At twenty, he had the face and body of a rapidly decaying seventy-year-old, the emotions of a slightly backward nine-year-old, and the astonishing intelligence of a genius when it came to his very few interests in life. Beautiful young women had never been one of them. Until now. Hi, I'm Pris, the young woman said. I'm lost and I don't have anywhere to live. I lay down here to rest for a while. Can you help me? You came to the right place, said Sebastian eagerly. The apartments here are empty. Everybody from this sector went off-world, except me. They wouldn't let me go. They said I wasn't going to live long enough to justify the cost of the trip because of this weird disease I have. But don't worry, it's not catching. Come with me. I can give you food, make you comfortable. "'You're awfully nice,' said Pris with a dazzling smile. "'Do you live alone?' "'Yes. Well, not exactly. But you'll see.' Sebastian unlocked the five locks to his apartment, opened the door, and shouted, "'Yoo-hoo! Home again! Home again!' A three-foot-high military man and a teddy bear dressed like Napoleon marched to greet him. They stared blankly at Pris. Home again, home again, jiggity jig, the bear muttered. Then both of them turned and marched away. They're not used to strangers, Sebastian apologized. You see, I made them to be just my friends. But it'll be real easy to reprogram them to be your friends, too. I hope "'You'll be my friend,' said Pris, taking off her coat. "'But you must have lots of friends,' said Sebastian. "'Just a few,' said Pris. "'She put her hands on his thin, hunched shoulders "'and looked into his bright, boyish eyes. "'I'll bring them to meet you. "'They need help, too.' 
You know, I think you're the one person in the city who could really, truly help us. Chapter 5 Deckard was doing what he did best, putting pieces of a puzzle together, working as fast and efficiently as a machine. In his apartment, he examined the snapshots he had found in the hotel room. They told him nothing, except that reps kept snapshots as mementos. They must have been fond of one another, he thought, maybe more than fond. Maybe they even loved each other. He should have asked Dr. Tyrell about the chances of that happening, though he had a hunch that Tyrell wouldn't have an answer at his fingertips. Nothing could have been further from Tyrell's calculations. Next, Deckard used his Esper scanner to examine the photos he had taken of the hotel room. The machine lit up every detail. In a photo of a dark closet, among shabby suits, hung a showgirl's shimmering gown. Deckard played with the Esper's dials to get a picture of who had worn the clothes. All he got were crazily colored blurs. He dialed for more information. The Esper's static-filled voice declared that the suits belonged to a large man and the dress belonged to a woman who had forgotten it in her haste to leave. Big news, thought Deckard silently cursing the salesman who had sold him this expensive marvel of modern detective technology. When Deckard asked it to identify a mysterious speck he had picked up from the hotel room floor, the Esper threatened to blow a microchip. Deckard had to guess on his own that the speck was a fish scale. But he found out he was wrong when he went to trace its source at the all-night city fish market. A Cambodian woman who made fish replicas told him it was a scale from a snake. By now, Deckard was all charged up, the way he always got on a job, as if electricity were running through him, pushing him faster and faster. Just one thing slowed him down. Rachel. She was waiting for him at his apartment door when he got back from the fish market. She said she had come to tell him she certainly wasn't a replicant. It must have been a joke by her boss. But Deckard only had to look into her dark eyes to see the question that was flickering there. He knew she had come to find out who she really was. Deckard told her to come in. He told her to have a drink. And then he told her everything. He told her exactly what the results of the Voigt-Kampf test proved. He told her about the memories Tyrell had planted in her brain. He left her with no way to escape the truth with nothing to do but flee the apartment when he went to the kitchen to fetch them another round of drinks. It was only after he found her gone and had his drink and then hers that he realized why he had been so rough in pounding the truth home. It wasn't Rachel he was talking to when he made sure there could be no denying what she was. It was himself. The next night, sitting in a crowded bar, Deckard still couldn't shake off the memory of the light going out of Rachel's eyes, of her face melting into tears. The picture stuck in his mind like grit in the gears of a machine, grinding it to a halt. He should have been concentrating on the next move in the case. Instead, he punched out her number on a video phone. Her face appeared on the screen, hardening when she saw him. 
Still hunting skin jobs, Mr. Deckard? Look, I made a mistake last night, said Deckard. A mistake, said Rachel in a cutting voice. But you never make mistakes. You told me so yourself. I told you I was wrong. Wrong, said Rachel, and at last Deckard saw a spark of interest in her eyes. I had no business tearing into you that way, said Deckard. I want to patch things up. Let's have a drink and talk it over. Meet me at the Snake Pit. It's a show bar in the fourth sector, a real fun place. See you in a half hour. Deckard hung up. He had no idea what he'd say to her when she arrived. Maybe a few drinks would be the best way to make her forget. He'd have to keep playing it by ear. But right now, all he could do was wait and see. An hour later, he was still waiting, and beginning to wonder if the gleam in Rachel's eyes hadn't been hope, but rage. He sat alone, looking at the snakes decorating the bar walls, crawling on the floor, and wrapped around women who were wearing little else. The snakes were replicas, of course. Otherwise, they would have cost a fortune. But the showgirls were clearly real, their flesh warm against the snakes' cold scales. Except for one, thought Deckard. One who looked even more enticing than the others. She was billed as Salome, and when she finished her act and went backstage, Deckard couldn't wait for Rachel any longer. He had a job to do. A skin job. Jora. Underneath the elaborate wig and thick makeup, Salome was Jora. Deckard was sure of it. The trouble was, he wasn't sure enough to pull out his blaster and pull the trigger. He had never had this trouble before. He had never had to hesitate. That was before Nexus 6. That was before Rachel. Deckard had to be absolutely sure. He had never made a mistake and didn't mean to start now. He knocked on her dressing room door. When she opened it a crack, he said, I'm from the morals squad. Mind if I come in? He was through the door before she could stop him. That was the last time he was too fast for her. She knew instantly that he was not looking at her the way other men did. Before he could stop her, she picked up a python from her act and swung it at him like a club. He dove out of the way, whipping out his blaster as he hit the floor. But his shot went wild as her kicking foot doubled him over in pain. Then Jora was out the door, running like the wind. He went after her. Out on the street he fought through the shifting tides of people. There was a break in the crowd, and he saw her hurrying far ahead. He got off a shot, its noise drowned in the traffic din. The blaster projectile tore through her shoulder, but incredibly she kept moving faster, right into the front of an oncoming bus. Jora was dying when Deckard reached her. Her bloodied face was a mask of hate. Deckard turned away and saw Rachel looking at him with horror. Wait! he shouted as Rachel disappeared into the crowd. He squeezed through the packed people, hunting her. Suddenly, a huge hand clamped onto his shoulder. He was lifted and hurled into an empty alley. I came to warn her. Too late, said Leon, plucking the blaster from Deckard's hand and tossing the weapon away. Leon's sledgehammer fist slammed into Deckard's stomach. Painful to sweat with fear, isn't it? 
The fist sank in again, and Deckard felt a rib crack. Painful to be in the power of people you despise. Leon's open hand bobbed Deckard's head from side to side like a punching bag. Painful to want so much from life. Painful to be able to do so much. Painful to be given so little. Leon's tiny, angry eyes moved closer. I was born April 19th, 2015. How long do I live? Four years from then, Deckard said through split lips, his tongue salty with blood. A few weeks, maybe just days from now. At least I have more time left than you, Leon said, joining his hands over his head to bring them down in a death blow. Deckard saw it coming. Then he saw Leon look surprised and topple to the ground. And suddenly Deckard was facing Rachel, standing in the opening of the alleyway, his blaster in her hand. Now I'm as bad as you, she said, letting the blaster drop to the asphalt. Deckard put his hands gently on her shoulders, but she turned away. I forgot, she said. I can never be like you. Isn't that right? Never. Then she froze. Deckard followed her gaze. He saw Bryant down the street, with Gaff and a squad of cops clearing a path through the people. Let me go, please, Rachel said, before they see me. Go to my apartment, Deckard said. I'll be there as soon as I can. By the time Bryant spotted Deckard, Deckard was alone, his blaster in his hand. Bryant was grinning. What hit you, Deckard? You look as bad as the skin job you left under the bus. Then he saw the heap in the alley. Another one. You're too much. I'm bushed, said Deckard. I'm going home. Bushed? You can't kid me, Deckard. You're just getting into your stride. You can stay up slaughtering skin jobs all night. Just three more to go. Your arithmetic is lousy, said Deckard. Just two left. There's a new one loose, said Bryant. It belonged to Tyrell himself. He called to say it was ready for the scrap heap. But when we went to pick it up, it had gone on the lamb. Chapter 6 I looked out my window and saw the spinner coming, said Rachel. I knew it was coming for me. I knew enough to run. I suppose I owe you that much, at least. I owe you too, said Deckard. My life. I don't know why I went running to you, Rachel said. You of all people. You, uh... She stopped. A blade runner, Deckard said. Maybe it was because I had just finished talking to you, said Rachel, and you were the only person who came to mind. Maybe, said Deckard. Maybe it was something more than that, said Rachel. Something I felt about you. I don't know what. All I do know is that I've never felt this way about anyone before. Am I making any sense, Deckard? Whatever your reason was, said Deckard, you were right to come to me. He kissed her softly so as not to startle her. So this is what kissing is like, she said. They didn't give me that memory. 
Dr. Tyrell's niece must have lived a very sheltered life. I have so much to learn, Deckard. She looked around his apartment. I want to learn about you. Everything. Tell me, who are those pictures of? My wife. My kid. Where are they now? Off-world. They wanted to go. I didn't. Why? I don't know. Maybe because if I did, I wouldn't have any more choices left. I like to have choices. And me? What do you choose to do with me? The phone buzzed. Get out of range of the video, Deckard said to her. He picked up the phone and Bryant's face appeared. I hope I didn't disturb your beauty sleep, said Bryant. We found a stiff in the eighth sector, a frozen stiff, a Chinaman named Chu, one of Tyrell's top men. I figure batty. Get moving. Bryant's face vanished as the phone went dead. I have to move fast, Deckard said to Rachel. You'll be safe here. I'll be back as soon as I'm finished. You have to, said Rachel. I have to, said Deckard, punching out a name on his esper and then on his vid phone. A sleepy face appeared. Yes, said the man with a heavy German accent. Dr. Hermann Schlecht, in charge of Tyrell security? Yes. Deckard here, top investigative clearance. Code 474-TYF. Schlecht punched it out on his computer. Yes. What can I do for you, Mr. Deckard? How many people have direct access to Dr. Tyrell? Three. Who? Myself, Dr. Hannibal Chu, J.F. Sebastian. Spell that last name, please, Deckard said. J.F. Sebastian gazed with worshipful wonder at Roy Batty. Gee, he said. You're even better than I imagined. To think that somebody like me could have helped make somebody like you. It's hard to believe. Don't put yourself down so much, said Pris and kissed his cheek. You're sweet and kind and good. And brilliant, said Batty. You've beaten me four chess games running. That's only natural, said Sebastian. I can even beat Dr. Tyrell, and he designed your brain. I just did your body. And a superb job you did, said Batty. I wanted to make you everything that I would have wanted to be, said Sebastian. I wanted to make you as different from the way I am as I could. But you didn't, really, not when you think about it, said Batty. Deep down, you and I are the same. We're both scheduled to die soon. I argued with Dr. Tyrell about that, said Sebastian. I wanted you to live forever. Then part of me would live forever. I'd like that. Maybe it's not too late, said Batty. Maybe we could persuade the good doctor to change his mind. If he saw me face to face and saw what a good job you did. You really think so? said Sebastian. If only there were some way to reach him, said Batty. But there is! Sebastian's withered face looked almost young with joy. He went to a chessboard where pieces were arranged for a game already in progress. Triumphantly, he held up the black queen. I have the key!
Oh, a lot of these pictures were not in the movie. This is actually one of the coolest books I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, it's so fucking good. The speaker in Dr. Tyrell's bedroom on the 800th floor of the Tyrell building declared, Sebastian seeks entry to elevator and then to your private quarters. Identification verified. What does that idiot want at this hour? demanded Tyrell. Purpose of visit. End game. Queen to Bishop Six. Check. A slight frown passed over Tyrell's face. He got out of bed and went to his chessboard. His face darkened as he examined it. All right. Let him in. Tyrell was still peering intently at his precarious position on the board when the door to his bedroom opened. I've brought... A friend, said Sebastian, and Batty stepped past him. Tyrell's hand moved quickly toward a tasseled bell pole hanging over his bed. A burning look from Batty stopped him cold. Tyrell did his best to produce a warm smile. It looked as if it had been painted on his face by a clumsy artist. "'It's good to see you, my boy,' Tyrell said. "'You should have come here sooner. "'It's not an easy thing to meet my maker,' Batty said, "'moving to stand face to face with Tyrell. "'And what can your maker do for you?' asked Tyrell. "'Life. I want more life. You didn't give me enough.' I tried, believe me, said Tyrell. He patted Batty's shoulder soothingly, as if he were calming an upset child. I realized what a mistake I made by limiting your greatness. I did everything in my power to change your coding. But by the second day of your life, there was no altering the day of your death. What about EMS recombination? asked Batty. It created a deadly virus. A repressor protein could block that. It formed a fatal mutation, said Tyrell. But let's not continue with this, Roy. It breaks my heart to remember all my attempts and all my failures. Believe me, I love you as a father loves a son. My father, my master, my maker, said Batty, putting his hands reverently on both sides of Tyrell's smiling face. Batty squeezed, and Tyrell's smile caved in as his skull was crushed between Batty's powerful hands. Batty looked down with contempt at the corpse at his feet. Batty turned toward Sebastian, who seemed to have aged ten years in ten seconds. Don't feel bad, Sebastian. It's not your fault that I kill as easily as I do. You made me as I could be. He made me as I am. Then Batty said, Goodbye, my friend. I must rejoin Pris and go on the run again. You can think of us racing you hand in hand to the grave. In Sebastian's apartment, Batty found that Pris had beaten him to the finish line. Her riddled body lay where it had crumpled when one of Deckard's shots had scored a direct hit. I didn't want to kill her, Deckard said. I wanted to talk to her. I had questions to ask. But she attacked before I could say a word. Batty ducked behind a doorway in the apartment before Deckard could say another word. 
or get off another shot. Deckard had never imagined that anyone could move so fast. Deckard pressed against the wall and slowly edged toward the doorway, blaster in hand. Suddenly a fist smashed through the wall from the other side. A hand gripped Deckard by the wrist of his gun hand and pulled it through the gaping hole in the wall. Deckard felt the blaster being torn from his fingers. Then he felt agonizing pain as one finger, then another, was slowly broken. That's for Pris and Jora, Batty said in a voice as icy as death. That's just the beginning, little man. It's time for you to find out what being hunted is like. But here, take your blaster back. I don't want to make killing you too easy. I want to enjoy it. Deckard pulled his gun hand back. Transferring his blaster to his other hand, he moved away from the wall, almost tripping over his own feet in his haste. Batty's face appeared in the hole, and Deckard fired his last projectile. Batty moved his head a fraction, and the shot merely tore off an ear. Batty did not seem to notice, even though blood streamed from the wound. "'I thought you were better than that,' Batty said. "'I thought you were the best.' Deckard felt a trembling running through him that he had never known before. It took him a second to realize what it was. It was fear. Deckard turned and started running. Deckard made it out the front door of the apartment and up the building stairs. He entered an abandoned apartment and bolted the door. He looked around and chose a bathroom as a hiding place while he caught his breath. Then he heard a cracking noise in the marble floor. The floor was smashed open from below, and Batty's head came through like a battering ram. Batty pulled himself up through the hole. Batty had stripped down to a loincloth. He had smeared his body with Pris's blood like a savage getting ready for a sacred rite. Now he ignored Deckard as he turned on the water in a basin and lapped at it like an animal, an animal in desperate need. Deckard fled the bathroom, saw a skylight, climbed up to it on piled-up furniture, and smashed through it. He was on the roof. He stood under the vast night sky. Every muscle throbbed with weariness. Every breath whiplashed his lungs. Then he saw Batty coming up through the skylight after him. Deckard ran along the roof to the edge. He stared across a yawning gulf to a neighboring roof. He heard Batty's footsteps moving unhurriedly toward him and he leaped. He fell short, his fingers barely grasping the roof edge as he dangled forty floors above the pavement. Then he felt the breeze as Batty leaped over him to stand on the roof and look down at him. Ooh, another beautiful page break with a full page picture, which means while I turn the pages, it's a beer break. Now you know what it feels to cling to life, Batty said. You know what it's like to feel your grip weakening and know there is nothing you can do about it. By now, the broken fingers of Deckard's hand had lost their grip. The fingers of his other hand were cramping, slipping, but all Deckard could see was Batty's cold smile. All Deckard could feel was rage. "'You want me to beg,' Deckard snarled up at Batty. "'You want me to plead with you to save me. 
Well, get your kicks from somebody else. His fingers lost their hold. His body fell. His arm was nearly wrenched from the socket as Batty's hand grabbed his. Deckard swung over empty space. No more games, he managed to say. Just let me drop and get it over with. Then he was hauled upward and found himself standing on the roof with Batty. For a moment that seemed to stretch into eternity, they stood face to face. Then Batty sank down to lie on his back. Hauling Deckard up had exhausted his fast-fading strength. You have courage, Batty said to him. You are the only human I have met with as much courage as I. Perhaps you have even more. Even I was tempted to beg not to die. Batty paused as his mind turned feelings into words. I could not destroy courage like that. It would be like destroying what is best in me. Deckard sat beside Batty as Batty stared up at the star-filled sky. You know, said Batty, I have never spared a life before. I am glad I was able to do it now. I am glad I have been free not to kill at least once before I die. Chapter 7 I watched him die all night, Deckard told Rachel, as they sat side by side in a police spinner the next morning. It was a long, slow thing, and he fought it all the way. He never whimpered, and he never quit. He took all the time he had, as if he loved every second of life, even the pain. He told me of what he had seen in the most distant outposts of space. He told me what he had felt in the depths of his heart. He told me everything he could before it vanished with him forever. Now you must tell me something. Rachel said. You saw Tyrell's file on me, didn't you? I had top investigative clearance, said Deckard. Then did you see how long I have to live? I could have, but I didn't, Deckard said. I didn't want to find that out about you any more than I'd want to find it out about myself. Do you think there's a chance? There's always a chance, said Deckard. You're one of Tyrell's experiments. Maybe he wanted to see what would happen if you kept on living. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. The spinner communicator buzzed. Deckard pressed the receptor button while Rachel moved out of sight. Brian's face filled the screen and his voice boomed out. Great job, Deckard. I knew you could do it. They still haven't made another Blade Runner who can come close to you. Drop in and collect your bonus. I already have, said Deckard one of your spinners. I'm going on a little vacation for the rest of my life. You never get tired of kidding yourself, do you? said Bryant, grinning. I'll just have to dangle a skin job in front of you, and you'll come running. But okay, you've earned a rest. Take off for a week. Gaff will be able to handle that last one, Rachel, or whatever its name is. 
easy as shooting fish in a barrel. He might find it a little tougher than that, said Deckard, and held his blaster in front of Bryant's suddenly narrowing eyes. Then Deckard snapped off the communicator and pressed the starter. The spinner lifted above the city streets. It sped northward through the misty air. Soon it reached the clearer air where the city ended. There the rolling fields began, abandoned since the city had sucked the people into itself, then funneled them off-world. Beyond lay the forests and mountains, from where life had fled, and where life could be born anew. Deckard had one hand on the controls, the hand with two fingers in splints. His other arm was around Rachel. "'They've left it all behind for us,' he said. "'We're heirs to all the earth.' "'But for how long?' asked Rachel. "'How does that old-fashioned vow go?' said Deckard. "'For as long as we both shall live.'" Thank you for listening to Blade Runner, a story of the future, illustrated with more than 60 color photographs based on the movie starring Harrison Ford. Story adaptation by Les Martin. This is your narrator, Amy Mullen. This was a pleasure to read. For one thing, in less than 100 pages, I felt that it really nailed the movie even if a lot of the scenes were different from what was actually filmed. But in terms of the characterizations and the motivations and setting the scene of such a beautiful, atmospheric, um, archetypal, groundbreaking movie, I think it did a fantastic job. It's the first novelization that I've been able to read in one sitting. And uh, it, it, I thought it was fabulous. I really wish that I could describe some of the photos here because I think a lot of these photos weren't actually in the movie. I think it's based on a much earlier script. And not only that, I just love the base work, that um, the, the seed work that it was based on which is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, which I think is one of the books, one of the best books ever written. So thank you for listening to Blade Runner, a story of the future. And as we know now, which we didn't know in the original movie, uh, it takes place in the year 2019. So this is only five years away.